Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are watching. Um, welcome to this very exciting session as part of the climate breakthroughs today, um, the Nature Positive Race to Zero. As we all now recognize, the world faces these converging environmental crises that are inextric inextricably linked, the accelerating destruction of nature and the challenge, the crisis of climate change. Now, nature underpins our global economy across these two issues. It generates approximately $44 trillion of global economic value. And as stated in the World Economic Forum's Nature and Net Zero report, which we relaunched again today, we know that it can deliver up to one third of the required net emission reduction of 23 gigatons of CO2 equivalent that we need. I'm delighted to say we're also releasing today um, with our friends and colleagues from the United Nations Environment Programme and GIZ from Germany, a very important report called the State of Finance for Nature. This report highlights that uh, 133 billion US dollars a year ca currently flows into nature, but that's a mere 0.01% of global GDP, with public funds making up 86% and private finance 14%. So even in that very, very tiny amount that we need, a lot of it is public funds. So as this report makes clear, we need to at least triple this by 2030 if the world is to meet its climate change, biodiversity, and land degradation targets. So it's a pretty clear question. How on earth do we scale the action and scale the finance to set in motion this systems transformation that we need. So we're delighted to have you here watching uh, and engaging in this conversation and we are so excited to have some pretty major voices from the finance and private sector to stake, take stock of this issue. Land use practices in the current context of decarbonisation, where the finance is flowing, some good ideas, what will it take? And as we head to COP26, it's imperative that we mainstream this nature and land use agenda, so it's no different in how we look at tackling the climate crisis for most other key transformations that we are hearing a lot about today in shipping and in steel, in hydrogen and in other industry and fuel sectors. We know that delivering a nature positive net zero future for land use will be challenging and will require a coordinated systems transformation, but with collective action it is possible. So. Um, before we get on to the lineup of our excellent panelists and spend the next 45 minutes or so diving into what will be quite an exciting interactive discussion, um, we can set the scene with um, some very special guests. To begin with, we have a pre recorded message from Teresa Cristina Correa, who is the Minister of Agriculture of Brazil, one of the most important agricultural producers globally. Followed, I'm delighted to say, straight after, by Inger Anderson, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, um, and who led this fantastic report that's been released today. After that, we'll move on to one of the high-level climate champions, Gonzalo Montes, um, but we'll go back to me first. So, uh, we'll have an opportunity to take questions from the floor in the last few minutes of the panel, and we welcome participants to ask those questions. You can use the Slido on your screen, the QR code, or the Zoom chat. And if you're watching this session on social media or the website, do share your reflections under the hashtags, hashtag climate breakthroughs, hashtag race to zero. Thank you very much. Um, so let's watch the video and then um, Inger Anderson will turn straight to you straight after that video for your comments. Thank you very much. Caros amigos, gostaria de cumprimentar as autoridades, panelistas, funcionários do Fórum Econômico Mundial e todos aqueles aqui presentes. Como sabemos, a mudança do clima afeta diretamente a produção agrícola, com impactos nocivos à segurança alimentar e à preservação da nossa biodiversidade. É nosso dever, portanto, priorizar a redução das emissões globais de gases de efeito estufa. A agricultura e a bioeconomia devem estar prontas a dar suas contribuições. No Brasil, trabalhamos com afinco para chegar à neutralidade de carbono em 2050. Buscamos liderar pelo exemplo 
ao compartilharmos nossa vasta experiência com a agricultura de baixo carbono. Nos últimos 10 anos, ultrapassamos nossa meta de mitigação e conseguimos que 50 milhões de hectares, 20% da área cultivada brasileira, adotem tecnologias de baixa emissão. Para escalarmos essas conquistas, inclusive globalmente, devemos promover sempre o que há de mais moderno. A inovação no campo, portanto, não pode ser excludente. O termo soluções baseadas na natureza não nos traz ainda a clareza necessária para formularmos um pacote tecnológico realmente ambicioso e transformador. O conceito pode dar a impressão, por exemplo, de que apenas as tecnologias naturais seriam legítimas. Acreditamos que o melhor caminho é o dos sistemas paralelos, combinando o melhor da natureza com toda a capacidade criativa da ciência. Somos favoráveis à visão holística e abrangente do que chamamos de abordagens baseadas em ecossistemas. Reconhecemos a existência de distintos caminhos igualmente legítimos para a sustentabilidade e, ao mesmo tempo em que evitamos o reducionismo de respostas idênticas a realidades diferentes. Tenho a certeza de que teremos inúmeras oportunidades para coletivamente buscarmos soluções que farão a diferença para gerações futuras. O Brasil enquanto potência agroambiental, está pronto para fazer a sua parte. Muito obrigada. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this uh, this forum. And of course, it's a great, great pleasure to be here as we launch this State of Finance for Nature report uh, together with our friends uh, at the World Economic Forum and GIZ. Uh, look, uh, Alex Sharma recently had to give a speech in which he asked his daughter's advice what he should say. And they said, pick the planet. And I think that we should be picking the planet, because that really is the future here. And we should come with three clear priorities, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, help people and nature to adapt to climate and let nature be part of the solution, and obviously secure that poorer nations get clean technology. And I do think that we are seeing a degree of momentum in UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. We're speaking about these three planetary crises, the climate crisis, the nature and biodiversity crisis, and the pollution crisis. And these are really interlinked. But the momentum that we're trying to build with COP26, with COP15 for biodiversity, with a de uh, decade for ecosystem restorations, these three coming together allows us something to build a global, uh, global alliance. And with the WEF stepping in, and as we see from the business sector and the finance sector leaning in, we have an opportunity we can not let go of because nature does, and this is what this report tells us, nature does uh, hold these many solutions, our health, the quality of our lives, our jobs, temperature regulations, the housing that we built, and of course, the food we eat, the water we drink, etc., etc. Now, let's be clear, nature-based solutions and investing in nature is not a substitution for decarbonization. We have to deeply decarbonize our economies, but investing in nature is part of a long-term solution while we decarbonize and indeed to secure future life on earth. Now, this report says that we have spent, uh, we need to spend more. Uh, and maybe it sounds like $354 billion a year sounds like a lot. Let me put it to you that, that that's just three times what we people spend on pet food. And if we think about per year, and so if we think about the kind of expenditure that we need to lean in on, actually it's peanuts when we have frankly, talking about securing the planet and our very own uh, future. So the business case is there for investing in nature, but we need to make it stronger and clearer. Governments need to set some guardrails around incentives, around regulations, around pushing and setting stimulus in the right direction. But the 
early bird will get the worm here. And the business that are leading in on pro-nature, pro-positive investments will be the ones that have con that have contributed to creating those markets. Right now, we're pouring trillions of dollars into the economy. Clearly, they need to be aligned with nature positive. Um, we understand from IPBES, which is a twin sister to IPCC, uh, and therefore provides the science that there are these five drivers of nature loss, of biodiversity loss. And one of these is agriculture. We need to accept what we all need to eat. So we need to ensure that agriculture does, we don't vilify agriculture. We, we make agriculture part of the solution. And there are people here in this group that would be speaking exactly to this. The Dasgupta review that Her Majesty's Treasury issued recently in the UK speaks to making nature as an asset class, understanding that labor is important, capital is important, infrastructure is important, but nature matters too, and understanding that on the national accounts as well as in the business sector. So uh, clearly, if we want to heal that ailing planet, we need to get on this train. That is what this report speaks to. That is what we need to do. And there are within this report a series of dimensions of actions that government needs, governments need to take, that private sector can take, and that we as individual consumers in the economy need to take. And it's not impossible. It's actually the only solution forward. And so we're very excited about this report. And I really do want to thank the World Economic Forum, as well as the GI said, for the collaboration that we had in, um, together with ourselves, uh, the United Nations Environment Program on the State of Finance for Nature report. Um, and obviously, I very much want to thank the UK government, as well as the Chilean presidency that is holding it right now, for placing nature clearly in the context of COP25 under Chile's presidency and COP26 under the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ingrid Anderson, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. And thank you on behalf of all of us on this planet for your leadership and the great team that you have over in Nairobi and spread around the world. And of course, our thoughts are very much with all of your colleagues and all colleagues who are watching who are facing very difficult times at the moment with the COVID pandemic. This balance of climate and nature is so interesting and so important. And, um, um, uh, Executive Director, if I may say so, you've put your finger on it very much so with the agricultural sector and the innovation um, that it can drive. We heard from the minister uh, there from Brazil that uh, when we're thinking about nature-based solutions and nature, it's not a backwards-looking agenda, it's a forward-looking agenda with the innovation of finance, the innovation of technology, together with biodiversity conservation at its heart. It's very much the road to COP26 and beyond, which is the framing of this uh, device. And Gonzalo uh, Manez, you're one of the uh, COP champions. Some people might not quite understand what that means. We all do, and you're working so hard on this. You've done a brilliant, brilliant job through COP25 and through COP26. And fascinatingly, for those who are not close to this space, you have been brave enough to bring together this climate and nature agenda and have what you call breakthrough initiatives also on nature and climate. Um, perhaps building on what we heard from um, the minister from Brazil and from the executive uh, director of, of UNEP, you could explain a little bit more about that um, and perhaps highlight on um, one or two of the breakthroughs that you are pursuing to link uh, agriculture, climate and nature positive finance. Gonzalo Munoz, COP25 slash COP26 champion, over to you, sir. Thanks so much, Dominique, and, and thank you for to the WEF for, for setting this really fundamental topic on the road to COP26 and beyond, as you said, because at the end, most of what we're doing is beyond Glasgow and, and, and should also start um, positioning ourselves on the serve of continents like Africa in which this agenda uh, should land very, very actively. Uh, let me explain why nature-based solution is so important 
in our agenda as high-level champions, but mostly, as you said, Dominique, what does it mean to reach a breakthrough or what's the ambition of the breakthrough? So in simple numbers, to stay within 1.5 degrees by 2050 means that on one side, one third of the emissions will have to be reduced from real industry transformation across all sectors, some we know very hard to abate at the moment. We have also accepted scientific consensus that leaving one third of remaining emissions in the atmosphere is the most we can accept without excessive damage. This means the remaining one third will have to be put back into the carbon sinks, primarily land by restoring degraded land and completely transforming how we farm all of our food. So, of course, we must immediately halt emissions from land conversion that only make the climate health, uh, the, 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 the climate health and development issues worse uh, the longer we wait. If this doesn't happen, many of the net zero commitments being made today will not be feasible in the overlap climate equation. So agriculture alone plays a, a critical role as is the largest driver of land use change and deforestation in the tropics accounting for for more than 90% of the estimated forest loss in the last two decades. So while all of this, of course, may sound daunting, the good news is that first, it is possible. Second, it is good business. And third, the benefits to resilience are just as great and vastly justified taking action. It is very clear to us that nature-based solution climate uh, exists, are mature, are cost-effective, and are scalable. Recently, some scientific collaborations like Drawdown have collected the existing investable and scalable solutions to reverse climate change and rank them accordingly to the abatement potential. The result is staggering. As much as 270 gigawatts of CO2 equivalent can be removed through nature-based solutions. Our campaign partners, Exponential Roadmap, uh, they have a research that is consistent with this, indicating that as much as 98 gigatons of CO2 equivalent can be reduced and removed from the atmosphere by as early as 2030. Furthermore, nature-based solutions uh, also deliver co-benefits, like more biodiversity, we have on the other side the fire, draw, flood preparedness, the economic diversification resulting in enhanced resilience, which is equi equally important in addressing climate change and, of course, delivering the, on the SDGs. This is nothing short of a complete overall of the way we use land, pivoting from the present net source of 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions to an equally large net sink. This, all of this cannot be done without a commensurate level of investment overall from public and private sector. So we believe that there's simply no reason why today those 600 billion uh, of, of a year public subsidies to agriculture should contribute to deforestation are not, and, 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 and on the other side are not aligned with the Paris Agreement goals as highlighted by the just rural transition. There's equally no reason not to deploy the 300 billion per year investment required to produce the 5.7 trillion dollars on economic benefits by 2030 and the 4.5 trillion dollars on business opportunity according to the fall coalition. The financial alliances like the GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which we helped launch at the Earth Summit, will be absolutely instrumental in delivering on these financial and business opportunities. So when it comes to forest, agriculture, and commodity trade supply chains, the, the, the to supply chains, the report we launched together with the World Economic Forum shows that of the eight uh, of the highest potential of, uh, for, for greenhouse gas abatement, the food supply chain is number one, with 55% of decarbonization viable to nature-based solutions. Our work with, uh, with all of the partners will accelerate how major food suppliers join the race to zero, and our evidence demonstrate that those major food suppliers with a science-based target also have higher strength and implementation of their deforestation commitments as of Forest 500. All of what I've mentioned until now is the reason why 
with my dear friend and colleague Nigel Topping as high-level champions for uh, COP25 and COP26, we incite that 20% of the food supply industry adopt a science-based target aligned with 1.5 degrees by no later than COP26 this year, and at the same time, 20% of financial institutions by asset answer manager commit to land conver conversion-free investment portfolios by 2023 and to become nature positive by reversing biodiversity loss associated with investment and leading portfolios by 2030. That's the, uh, the what, is, what we call the breakthrough ambition on this aspect. If we do that, we can take out at least 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent from the atmosphere by 2030 and be on our way to an entirely carbon negative food and agriculture system by 2050. So we invite all institutions to join uh, one of our member coalitions and in doing so joining the largest ever collective uh, committed to the same overarching goal, having emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero emissions by 2050 at the very latest. Uh, Gonzalo, thank we, you very much. Um, we're yeah. going to have to um, just hold you there because there were so many brilliant statistics that you were um, providing. But um, to pivot to our panel, just those two, which were the champions' uh, uh, challenges, can you say that again? There was 20% of um, food supply come. Can you say that one first? The, the, the uh, ambition of the breakthrough is having 20% of the major food suppliers to be committed to be part of Race to Zero, meaning having the emissions by 2030 and becoming net zero by 2050 at the very latest. That was number one. Brilliant. And then the second one was related to finance. What was that one? Right. That, that means that all of the 20% uh, of the financial institutions by asset under management commit to land conversion free investment portfolio by 2023 and to becoming nature positive by reversing biodiversity loss associated with the investment uh, by 2030. Brilliant. Um, so those are very clear challenges. By the way, thank you so much in your role as champions with um, the UK. Uh, a COP champion to get that kind of nature and climate piece into the challenge. These are not just energy transitions or industry transitions, nature, landscapes, agriculture, food is equally part of the challenge itself. That was brilliant, Gonzalo, and thank you for all of the amazing work that you are doing. That takes us, stay with us, and um, we'll be coming back to you. I'm sure there's questions that have been triggered, um, but that takes us to our panel discussion. Um, we have got such a great group um, of uh, speakers to take this baton forward that has been set out by the Minister, by the Executive Director of UNEP and by the COP champion from Chile. They include Rianne Marie Thomas, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Green Finance Institute. Welcome, Rianne Marie. Uh, Veeb Dreyer, who's the Chairman of the Managing Board of Rabobank. And Walter Schalke, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Susano Holding. Now, welcome all of you, and some of you watching might be thinking, hang on a minute, when I watch these kinds of panels, I usually see someone from, I don't know, the Nature Conservancy or uh, WWF, the uh, wildlife organization. What's going on? Here are, here are people who know all about banks and finance and companies. That's exactly the point of this discussion, to build on all of the amazing work that the civil society and NGO community have done and all of the insight that's been created to show how important nature and biodiversity is and then to explore what that means as we mainstream some of these discussions into uh, the world of finance, the world of business and see what we can find. That is the point of the panel today. It's very, very exciting. And to that end, Rianne Marie Thomas, if we could start with you. Uh, it's clear from what we're hearing that private sector finance seems to be a key part of this puzzle. The numbers are huge and we're not there yet. People are saying 133 billion a year of which a large part of that is public finance and we need to get to somewhere around 600 billion. Um, so what, what are the major roadblocks that you feel are slowing down the private sector agenda from scaling these nature-based solutions? And as much as the roadblocks, what do you propose or what do you sense are some of the actions that could help overcome them? 
Well, thanks, ever, you. thanks ever so much, Dominic. And uh, may I start by congratulating you on your report today. Uh, very much look at the, the headlines are very arresting and I look forward to actually reading it in more detail. So quickly to answer your question, I think the challenge is, is really twofold. It's about decreasing flows of capital towards nature negative outcomes and increasing the flow towards nature positive activities, the scaling up that you're mentioning. And if we do both, well, we need to do both if we hope to have this global transformation and clearly you know this isn't going to be an easy answer so I'm going to have to rattle through but try and keep it and try and keep it brief but on the first point of how you decrease it you know what are the enablers well obviously public policy can change behaviors Redu reducing subsidies incentives environmental regulation but for the financial sector in particular it's about understanding the risk of financing nature negative activities and and equally the opportunity of investing in nature positive solutions we We've heard these mantras before when we were discussing climate and clearly you know there are huge intersections and overlaps between climate and nature and fortunately one of those overlaps is we have a bit of a green print how to do this so on understanding risk the task force on nature related financial disclosures very much following in the footsteps of the TCFD is going to be crucial that importance of disclosure. We'd really encourage everyone for their engagement, you know, to engage with the TNFD, which is uh, launching in earnest next month. But, you know, the TNFD is going to take, uh, you know, this is a complex issue. It's going to take a few years before that framework is, is fully finalized. But there are things that the finance sector can already be doing to assess risk. Um, just earlier this week, we published our 12 recommendations for the finance sector to turn the Descupta reviews finding into action based on the inputs of over 40 financial institutions so to your point Dominic huge engagement from you know people who've genuinely got their levers on um, making capital move um, and the first four of those recommendations they lay out how to begin a journey of addressing nature related risk through using tools like trace or methodologies or frameworks like those from the CDSB or the science-based targets for nature joining PBAF or implementing no harm to nature policies like um, the ones that Gonzalo has just alluded to in those targets um, and engaging with and applying sustainability certifications and verification. Which leads me very quickly onto the second point, which is how do you drive more finance at scale into nature-based solutions and nature-positive objectives? Well, again, firstly, we need to understand what is nature positive. We need those standards and those metrics. You know, we've been talking for a while about taxonomies in climate. Well, clearly, you know, again, we've learned that lesson to know what we should be investing in. And, you know, some, some investment firms have already grappled, you know, started grappling with this, but they are a, a small group. Um, the, the Nature Capital Investment Alliance, for example, is working on sharing learnings in this area. And it would be really useful if national governments conducted baseline and target setting and assess the finance gap. That's something that we called for from the Green Finance Institute um, so that the finance sector can understand what needs investment. It would really also signal transition risk. Um, so again, there are so many that, you know, there's a clear analogy here with the blueprint that we've set out for climate or, or green print, maybe I should call it. Um, and plenty more to say on that, including on, you know, scalable NBS projects using concessionary or de-risking de capital to support pipelines of development project. We need demonstrate and examples to give investors confidence that returns, risk-adjusted returns are possible and to capture and share those learnings. So in the UK, we've got the Nature Environment Investment Readiness Fund that we've been working on with DEFRA and the Environment Agency, or in the EIB, you have the Natural Capital Finance Facility, for example. And then my very final point, aggregation is also key lots and lots of micro scale projects that are and pilots that are demonstrating how we channel capital towards nature-based solutions but we need to find a way of establishing a fund that aggregates those investment ready projects into a scale that uh, would attract institutional investment um back to you Dominic. thank you so much ramary thomas chief executive officer of the green finance institute now if you're watching this um, you'll, I mean, it was just it was so interesting. There's so much going on. Um, and you might cast your mind back to when the first time you heard the acronym TCFD, maybe several years ago, you thought, what is that? That's surely not going to uh, 
uh, uh, kind of change anything. And look at the challenges, look at the changes that have happened as a result. So TNFD, you probably heard it here just about first if you're watching this in Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures. Think about the impact that the um, uh, financial climate risk uh, community has had on the debate. Here comes nature and they're going to be joined at the hip and we are not going to be going backwards, the road to COP26 and beyond. Now, the very interesting thing about all of this, of course, is how does it actually play out in terms of those who are kind of working very much um, in these areas of finance? So, uh, uh, Viva Dreyer, you are the chairman of the managing board of Rabobank. It's brilliant to have you here and thank you for all that you do in this space. Some people um, unbelievably might not know quite what Rabobank is, so do, if you want to, just explain a little bit. Um, but you've been leading global efforts to unlock the kinds of finance that we've been hearing a little bit about from uh, Ria Marie and others. Um, so just kind of whether the agenda and how it's shaping up, is this resonating with you? You've been leading this transition. What kind of role and experience have you played? And I understand there's a particular example with something called the Agri3 fund, which might be something that uh, people would be interested to hear about as a concrete example. Um, over to you, sir, uh, Viba Dreyer. Thanks for those introductions and uh, thanks for permitting me to participate as a, as, a, as a player in the financial sector. We are, and, and, and by no means intended to be um, advertising, but uh, just to give you the reason why I'm here, we are a major food and ag bank in the world. Um, and in fact, uh, with Dutch heritage, um, there is a, stelling, a, a stellar uh, statistic, which, which is the following, that uh, half of the food that's being eaten in the world is touched by companies that somehow or another are a client of Rabobank. Wow. And uh, this gives you an enormous, an enormous um, responsibility to be precisely in the middle of the conversation that uh, was just taking place. And, and on a funny anecdote, I am frequently called by our... Uh, our uh, clients, and when I meet CEOs of major food companies, they call me the NGO of the banking sector. Um, <laughs> not because I talk banking, but because I talk change in nature. I talk uh, climate change. I talk uh, sustainable practices. And, and we have challenging conversations with major players saying, you need to take responsibility. I think we're doing and living precisely what many of these commitments that are related to, to, um, to uh, the Paris Agreements require us to do. Now, um, I think there are also some challenges on this, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit, permit me to talk a little bit about the challenges, and I'll talk about what we do. The challenges are that even if you have this mindset that we have, uh, it's pretty tough to um, to make these commitments uh, measurable and, 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 and quantifiable, particularly when you talk about these scope three uh, emissions that that um, that our public commitments require us to drive down to to the Paris Agreement and and the, the bandwidth of 1.5 degrees. These scope three emissions are the emissions that our clients cause. Now, if you're in some way, shape, or form related to so much of the food supply chain, you're being asked to push half of the global food supply to Paris. That is simply a ridiculous um, uh, request. So, so in a sense, wh what we need to find is a way of quantifying it and also enabling players like the Rabobank, but all the other financial institutions to be a driver. I think there is also a case made that, um, that uh, Gonzalo made, which is actually most of these things are in the money. So from a bankable point of view, if we can find a way to build up the trickles of finance that are there today, to build the experience, to de-risk the value change, to build uh, understanding, many of the flows that are being talked about, which are astronomical numbers, actually will move. And I think we're seeing the beginning of that. There are some real uh, constraints and our initiatives are involved in those. But I think the most important mindset that I'd like to bring across in this conversation is, I think we're going to a phase where the banks are committed, where the financial institutions are committed, where the investment funds are committed, where the pension funds are committed. But that's not the point. The point is we need to find a way to enable the farmers in the f food supply chains to have an incentive to participate. And banks have a role to play. And there are two moments of truth in the life of a farmer, if I would characterize them. One is when an investment takes place. And so what we are doing as a bank is to make all the financing decisions uh, when we do finance a farmer, 
there are a set of conditions that are looking at emissions, that are looking at nature-based positive um, uh, practices, that are looking at biodiversity practices, that are looking at practices that you can just tick off. And you make that conversation an equal paragraph as the conversation that you typically do as a bank when you look at the economics. The moment of investment is a moment of truth. The second moment of investment is actually the year, the, the crop, cropping season. And we, are think, we, we think that there is actually the, the best solution that we can bring to the planet, all of us, is to find these um, nature positive agricultural practices and to actually make it a living income for farmers. If we measure the CO2 captured by farmers and we compensate them for the CO2 that they capture, their income actually goes up. The reality of the, the biggest slice of the global food supply chain is that the economics are very meager. So if we can only bring some of that CO2 capture that they can provide, as uh, I think Gonzalo so eloquently uh, illustrated based on reports and, on the, and uh, the practices, if we can compensate them for that, their business model changes and they become an ally, they become an, an, an entrepreneur, they become the hero of the transition that we face. So the initiatives that we as our bank, for example, take is to help, and the agri thief fund that you talked about is one of such an example where we pair up with the United Nations Environment Programme, we create a fund of a billion, and the real goal of this fund is to de-risk the step that the farmer takes at the moment of investment. And so this fund is actually now investing in nature-positive solutions in Brazil, in nature-positive solutions in, in China, actual investments at the moment of truth, de-risking that, that change at the moment of truth of investment. The other initiative that I want to talk about, and I'll close, uh, Dominic, is um, what we call the carbon bank. And I personally am a deep, uh, deeply convinced that this is the answer that the planet needs. A carbon bank is the concept whereby if we measure at the farm gate what this farmer is actually putting into the ground by change practices measuring it, and we build a system where we can compensate this farmer for that practice, a bank in between, and we can sell those to clients that are in need of reductions, that's a whole new system. It's a system that the world needs. And we're actively involved in building this carbon bank solution so that our clients, both farmers, but also major food companies, can go to net zero uh, in their supply chains or on their farms. I think there's a very potent uh, solution. And if we can add Gonzalo's great numbers, and I couldn't follow your speed of your numbers, Gonzalo, I'm so impressed. But, um, but if you add into the mix of Gonzalo, the life of a farmer, and the moments of truth of a farmer and make the economics count at that moment. And banks can do that because they have an, an opportunity to be there when that moment is there. I think we can actually realize what you're saying. Thank you. Veep Dreyer, Chairman of the Managing Board of Rubber Bank, thank you so much. Now, if you're watching this um, and you're about to start your career, um, I think a few things should be going through your head that it's not just kind of tech and electronics, which is full of innovation. Here's finance and agriculture. Here's the net based nature-based solutions, here's the net zero space, here's food meets farmers meets finance. Um, there's a lot going on in this agenda. So this is pretty interesting. Let us turn uh, to Walter Schalke, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Susano. Um, Walter, uh, you're working, um, if you like, sort of um, you know, on the ground, literally trying out many innovative uh, models. Um, you have if I understand it, sustainability-linked bonds and such, which you might be able to tell us more about. But um, it'd be very interesting to kind of get your impressions of what you're hearing um, and what you're applying to try and create some solutions and what you feel obstacles are and ways to overcome them. Um, Walter Schalke, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, my greetings to you, Dominic, and to the other fellow panelists. Thank you for the opening remarks of our minister, Teresa Cristina. Inger Anderson, and thank you, Gonzalo, for your outstanding uh, role and job that you are doing in, in, our, in our favor, in the world favor. At Susano, we recognize the size of our challenge, and we are proper by our purpose. We knew life inspired by trees. We are the largest pole player in the world, but it's very important that we are 100% based on planted forest. We are planting 500,000 uh, trees every single day. In addition to that, we are re recovering the re degraded areas and we are planting one tree every two minutes uh, to recover uh, uh, land use. We, uh, we never cut nat native forest after 1994, on the last 26, 27 years now. 
And it's very important to mention that you have 2.3 million hectares as a total land. From that, 1.4 million hectares we are using for our planted forest, uh, recovering uh, degraded areas. In addition to that, we have almost 1 million hectares, 1 million hectares of land that we are preserving at this point of time. This is much more from the, 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 the requirements on our legislation here in Brazil that would be around 20%. We have 43% of our area there is uh, preserved uh, on our uh, operations. We believe there is time to action. We need to do it right now. We cannot procrastinate that for the next generations. We cannot wait for race to zero in 2050. We need to do it right now. We need to reverse the curve of greenhouse emission immediately in the world. And we are part of that. It's very important to mention to you that at this point of time, we are in the few companies or few industries in the world that we are carbon negative. Last year, we had a carbon sequestration of 15 million tons of carbon. And then we have a sequestration more than that and uh, 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 offset by uh, the scope one, two, and three emission on our operations. The net of that last year was around 15 million tons of carbon sequestration. We are based on a two concepts. There is what we call innovability. There is innovation and sustainability. And from the trees, we'd like to extract more than pulp and energy. We are selling energy, renewable energy in the grid right now. But with the help of WIB, WIB thank you very much, WIB, for supporting us on this process and many other banks, we have been increasing uh, our uh, sustainability linked bonds and loans. Uh, and we start from zero and right now 20% of our standing uh, balance sheet is coming from uh, green emissions. And these green emissions is allowing us to have what we call the greenium, the benefit of to everyone to, to combine uh, targets, very stretched targets in terms of sustainability on our operations in exchange of lower interest rates. This green here right now is represent around 30 base BIPs uh, on our operations. But we believe that we can do it even more in the future. And I'd like to invite all the other companies to follow this opportunity because it's a window to mitigate our interest costs on site with uh, challenges in the sustainability side uh, uh, to our operations. We have been uh, reaching uh, 2 billion customers every single month in the world, 2 billion customers. But we understand that we can do it even more, reaching the total population, being part of high, higher uh, carbon sequestration in the coming years. And it's very important that we have another target that is very uh, 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 sustainable. We want to replace 10 million tons of plastics in the coming years using our trees to enter not only uh, in the pulp market, but to enter in on the textile markets with our fiber as well, to enter on the bio-oil markets with our trees. And we believe that the tree, tree is the right side of the equation for the future. Thank you very much. Walter Schalke, Chief Executive Officer of Susano, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just as a quick follow-up question, if I may, Walter. Um, you set out an incredible uh, set of statistics um, about your, uh, if you like, your environmental uh, uh, footprint. But, um, you know, uh, uh, Viva Dryer is, 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 is no fool. He's investing uh, in you and in your products. So um, I presume Cezanne is doing quite well commercially as well. Could you just... For those who don't follow you so closely, how, how, is, your, how is your commercial uh, activities going? Is, are you just throwing everything at the environment and commercially it's, um, it's all going backwards? Or are you doing quite well in terms of your um, uh, profits and losses and such like that? Uh, we are doing extremely well. We have been improving uh, our results in the last many years. Uh, we, our cash flow have been improving. We are selling uh, right now to over 100 different countries in the world. A uh, large part of our production is exported right now. Almost 91% of the total production is exported for different countries in the world. And we have been providing, in one side, competitiveness uh, to, the, to the paper industry in the world. 
but sustainability as well. We believe that the combination of both will allow us to combine value creation uh, and uh, sharing with all stakeholders. We have three different pillars on our culture. It's people that inspire and transform. We want to create value and sharing value with all the stakeholders. And it's only good for us if it's good for the world. And we have been uh, uh, enhancing this culture in the organization uh, in order to change the culture, how we can do business and raise our voice as well, Dominic, because we believe that we need to mitigate or eliminate the illegal de deforestation uh, in the Amazon as well. There is representing 97% of the total deforestation. And this could create benefit to us. And I fully believe, as uh, we uh, and Gonzalo was mentioning, that the, the, the carbon market in the future that could be regulated uh, now in the COP26. And if, if the, all the regulators in Brazil included could be this part of the cap and trade system, this could create a, a way to finance uh, the future decarbonization of the world. Uh, Walter Schaka, very much appreciate those comments. Um, and it's fascinating to hear um, the range of uh, remarks that you just made there. But at the heart, um, you know, it's a very, very profitable uh, commercially driven uh, company which is doing all of these other things at the same time across those three pillars. There's no excuse um, in the kind of arena that you're working in. You can see how there's the win, there's the win, there's the win. At the heart of it is this uh, finance uh, piece. Um, we have, we've got a couple of questions um, coming in. So it's striking up a lot of um, interest um, for those watching. So thank you uh, very much. We'll come to those um, in a second. But just back to you, Rianne Marie Thomas. I mean, you're kind of working very much, you know, at the, uh, uh, the sort of policy influencing and new innovation level. And you just heard, I think, from a couple of um, key stakeholders who are perhaps slightly more on the operational side of things. A anything that you heard uh, resonates or, or, or strikes you? Um, and uh, any thoughts you'd like to kind of underscore or notes to to, to hit upon um, in the work that you're doing and from what you're hearing? Oh, quite a few points, actually. May I start with the idea that being called the NGO of the banking sector should be an aspirational title for anyone in a financial institution who wants to aspire to lead in this space. So, uh, Viva, we hope you get some competition for that title soon. Um, and then I think what really comes out to me when I'm, I'm listening to the comments here is that, um, you know, the collaboration between, as you say, Dominic, the policymakers and the financial institutions. So I'm a banker of 20 years standing now finding myself sitting at that nexus between the policymakers and the city or the, the mainstream financial institutions and we're looking at this this challenge together you know what this is absolutely key for land use transition is you know what what is going to bring those two sectors together to try and solve this and fundamentally there's no disconnect between what the private sector wants and what the public sector wants here. The economic risk of biodiversity loss is gonna impact both public and private sector alike. And as we've just heard so well described by Walter, organizations, including financial institutions, they do better when economies are thriving, but also when their employees feel engaged, when they're in the headlines for all the right reasons and their shareholders are happy. And we've seen that over the last decade and we realize where we're heading on this towards a net zero and nature positive solution future and that is a huge opportunity for those who want to establish themselves now as leaders just a couple of points though if i may about the opportunity for the public sector national government budgets are now really stretched in the aftermath of the awful pandemic um, and so here in the uk for example we have the environmental land management scheme which is being designed specifically with a view for private finance to be crowded in and where it makes sense for the polluter that can, that the polluter should pay. And therefore, you know, the need for government funding is reduced and can be put to work elsewhere where there is no private sector solution. And, you know, jobs is the other topic that we haven't touched on here. And that is the real glue between the public and the private sector. Um, you know, speaking again from, you know, a UK perspective here, some revenue generation creating nature-based solutions projects that could lead to investment are failing to get off the ground because the specialist skills that are required, for example, peatland restorations, um, that's not been well enough developed. So, but, and just one final point that I wanted to make 
actually there's so many other points I'd like to make but one of the points I'd like to make is about collaboration it's a point I make repeatedly when we're talking about climate and it obviously applies here on uh, for nature solutions as well um, collaboration needs to be born on trust and there is still some concern that if we welcome the private sector into this agenda will we just get a lot of greenwashing will we start just seeing forests of monoculture trees being sold as impactful for biodiversity and that's again where the role of disclosure and even mandatory disclosure really really is key disclosure helps us stay honest and it, and it sheds light on where the barriers are to transitioning that builds trust and it reduces risk so the development of investment principles to guide us um, you know, as before we start establishing solid taxonomies as well, that, that's going to be really, really useful. Um, and I just, my very final point um, before we go back to um, our fellow panelists is um, we've reached out to over 30 green banks recently to ask about their, you know, nature based solutions investment, and it's very limited. Um, for some, there's a good reason for that it's because their remit is specifically clean energy or energy efficiency. But several have replied saying that they're struggling to find the right revenue generating opportunities. So we've seen some fantastic examples actually in the US, um, sort of building off the sort of storm water retention credits market. And we've seen in Australia examples of investing in ag tech and offering wholesale loans to banks for farmers transitioning to less carbon intensive models, very similar to some of the ideas that um, we were hearing from Rabobank, um, which really just brings me back to the point you were making earlier to you know some of the listeners who may be at the start of their careers. I cannot think of anything more exciting right now than working in finance and trying to find a way of integrating science and integrating all these considerations into financial solutions and doing something that is genuinely so purposeful. Um, I certainly find it really, really fantastic way to spend my time. Rianne Marie, thank you so much. Uh, you touched on that disclosure issue and that trust piece there, which actually, if I uh, may, uh, v. Badraya, um Chairman and Managing Board of Rabbit Bank, come to you. We had a question that came in, I think is inspired by some of the comments that you were making around the uh, carbon bank uh, that you mentioned. And the question is, um, carbon finance has its problems. How can we avoid the mistakes we made in the past that saw small pockets of protection surrounded by much larger deforestation? Um, and I hope you don't mind, and thank you very much for sending that question in, anonymous. Uh, but uh, please, uh, 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 Weber Dreyer, maybe that's something that you could pick up because it's clearly something that resonated or in, in, in someone who's watching's mind. You're on mute, sir. Thank you very much for that question because it actually calls out a pink elephant in the room uh, about the carbon trading uh, history that we have. Uh, not we as Rao Bank, but the world has. And uh, many of the carbon... Um, projects that were, were uh, created as supply into the ETS system have had their track record of credibility problems. And hence, I think this concept of a bank actually, uh, and that's why we deliberately choose it, is required. Because what you do is what you, you actually commit, you commit as an institution to the credibility of the credits that are being offered and traded. So you actually put in the credibility of your own um, brand to certify that that uh, CO2 is real. And so um, that's one element. The second element is that certification uh, is the key. And uh, we're, for example, in a large initiative with uh, called Acorn together with Microsoft, where we use satellite technology to, um, to, to, to scientifically register the actual capture of CO2 in trees by smallholder farmers in Africa. And if you certify with that technology, then the trust can also be tracked and traced. And the money given to the farmer goes only to those who have credible proof that the CO2 was actually in the trees that are on their land. The trouble still sits with, um, with, with the soil in, the, in that the technology, um, uh, the cost of the technology to certify that the carbon that the farmer has captured in his land or her land is there, is still costly on a cost per ton basis. And, and some of the economics that Gonzalo talked about, of it being in the money, actually is washed away only by certification of CO2 that is in the farmer's land. 
we really, really need uh, innovative breakthroughs on that particular design issue. And so we need all the engineering skills. I would almost add um, to uh, Jan Marie's plea for getting into this equation right now uh, for engineers to join. I'm an engineer, I'm not a banker, I'm an engineer. For engineers to join to solve that problem. If we can solve that problem of low cost certification of CO2 in the ground, the issue of trust can easily be fixed by those two equations, proper certification with technology, and credibility of the intermediate institution that says I commit to the credibility of these um, of these uh, uh, this, this storage capture. That or in originally is uh, is what a bank stands for. So I just like to leave one thought if I can, and that's uh, to make the big numbers small. Um, hmm. In reality, that we are talking about a problem of the size of Gonzalo that equates to the equivalent of a Netflix account cost per month for an individual. So one element that we also need to bring into is the transparency side to consumers saying, this is the cost of your life in terms of CO2. And this is a vehicle by which you can participate in the big chain that we just talked about by trading some of your footprint. It only is about, in the Western world, only is about the cost of a Netflix account to fix this problem on a per consumer basis. So we need to create a way to make the, the problem small again at the consumer level, at the production level, at the farm gate, and at the intermediate stage by partnering the players in the chain. Anyway, I thought I would just want to leave not an answer to your question, but certainly something that helps the issue that was raised by Anonymous. No, Viva, thank you very much for that. Um, um, I, I love the quote, a problem the size of Gonzalo um, related to the cost of a Netflix account. Um, you didn't think you'd hear that on this panel, Gonzalo, did you, as the high level <laughs> champion, my friend? No. Um, I've heard a lot of things. We started with comparison with the pet industry, and, and that brought us to the Netflix. I can't love it. It's love wonderful. It. Well, maybe you can come to you. I, we, we've got so much more we could talk to. I've got um, a couple of minutes um, left. Um, uh, Walter, you gave us a very good kind of follow through as well on some of those comments. So um, if you'll forgive me, I'll turn to Gonzalo and then um, maybe uh, uh, just close out. Uh, Viva, to your, to your point, what was interesting, I think, I mean, I'm no expert in these things, but with all that could happen um, and the money that uh, could flow in, it almost um, means that it's much more profitable for that farmer, um, for, um, for them at that local level to be doing it this way. So there's perhaps less of a need for uh, distortionary subsidies or illegal this or illegal that, because there's plenty in the space. Um, so you're almost kind of crowding in, you know, much better livelihoods than, than would otherwise have been apparent, which I think is where Walter might have uh, been getting to. Gonzalo, um, we've heard a lot here. Uh, and um, just if you can, um, you know, in, uh, in a few seconds, um, some takeaways right. for us, then I'm obliged to close us out. Uh, even Thanks so much. Keep going. Yeah. Gonzalo, over to you. Thanks so much, Dominic, and, and, and a lot of things that have been shared. You started mentioning how this agenda uh, historically had not been kind of related to the business. I think that's a massive mistake, and, and I think it's a kind of mis mixture between ignorance and arrogance that uh, from the business leaders, and I think that uh, Weber and then Rian Marie brought uh, brilliantly uh, around the concept of the NGO in the banking. I assume that on the other side, many times when you meet our radical environmental friends, you're tagged in some other way as two capitalists, whatever. Let's stop tacking the agenda. As uh, as we heard also from Walter, we're talking about how life is severely compromised for humans and millions of other species, while the cost is a Netflix account. I mean, I think that this is urgent. It's an imperative. And hopefully, as we have been following some concepts and agenda positioning in the last decade, circular economy, ESG, TCFD, we really expect that we will see how TNFD from Rian Marie's proposal will take a, a, an, a relevant part of the agenda and mobilize, uh, for example, also regenerative agriculture as a new trend. And, and we really expect that that also relates very well to the importance of positioning resilience. And, and, and in our race to resilience, we have one of the tracks for mostly the, the lives of small farmers around the world. Many things to also share the importance of metrics baselines, uh, the, the importance of connecting to SDGs. But mostly, it's, uh, I think it's clear that we have heard 
of how much it is happening. There's no reason for inaction. We had brilliant examples coming from Susano, from Bravo Bank, uh, and also from all of the knowledge from Riyadh. So thank you so much. Looking forward for continued collaboration towards COP26 and beyond. Gonzalo Munez, uh, COP25 slash COP26 uh, champion, thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, Rianne Marie Thomas, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Green Finance Institute, Walter Schalke, CEO of Susano, Viva Drea, Chairman of the Managing Board of Rabobank, the Executive Director of UNEP, and of course, the Minister of Agriculture from Brazil. Um, well, there's a lot going on in this space. If you thought it was sleepy in the nature and climate interface, you are so wrong. There's um, innovations to be had, research to do, money to be made, livelihoods to help, and all sorts of brilliant interventions, innovations, and outcomes to get involved with. Thank you for watching, um, and uh, thank you also um, for watching some of the virtual ocean dialogues that have been going on over the last few days. Check them out. Um, on the websites to look at those recordings at the World Economic Forum. We're so proud to help to kind of bring these debates together and to advance the nature positive net zero agenda. Um, do check out this State of Finance for Nature report, which we did with our colleagues from UNEP and GIZ, as well as the upcoming report, Investing in Forests, the business case led by 1T.org that comes out in June. And it's super exciting to see all these initiatives appearing in the space, the TNFD. You heard that acronym, I bet, pretty much here first. I know, Ram Marie, um, that your institute will be quite closely involved in that. So go to the website, I'm sure, to find out more. Um, there are some other great initiatives that the forum and others around us are supporting. The COP champions, the LEAF coalition, the COP26 presidencies, food, agriculture and commodity trade, fact dialogues and many more. You'll find them all if you go Googling um, on uh, COP26 or thereabouts. And there are, of course, other web browser services available. Listen, we have to stop, um, but that was brilliant. It's just opening the lid, I think, on this fascinating area um, of the interface between nature, climate, finance um, for the road to COP26 and beyond. Thank you very much for watching.